All right, good to see everyone this morning. Are you ready to get into God's Word? We are talking part two in our series on giving, and we just gave uh, in worship, and we're trying to figure out exactly what that looks like. I want to challenge you to continue to think about your giving in a different way. Here's the problem. We just gave an offering, and, and we know we're supposed to give our very best, and we're supposed to give it with the right heart and the right attitude. And while we did that this morning, there's still a problem. See, um, when we give something, very often I think we have this mentality that it's, it's a perishable thing. I mean, that quite literally that when we give, especially like when we give at church, we give at a basket, we're not sure what happens with it. It's like it's literally going up in smoke, right? We give and all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. Where did it go, right? Where did the money that I put in that basket, where did it go? Now, there's this idea in our culture that millennials and Gen Zers are stingy people and that boomers are just flat out greedy. So we're all either stingy or greedy, but actually the evidence shows otherwise, especially with millennials and Gen Zers. It's not that millennials and Gen Zers are stingy. What they are is very intentional about where they invest, where they're giving. They want to give to something that makes a real difference. Now, I think that's the truth for all of us, isn't it? Yes. We want to make a difference. Would you like to make a real difference in the world? Yes. Would you like to have the resources that you have be used to make a real difference in the world? But when, when we see our money maybe just go up in smoke or we're not sure what's happening with it, and by the way, just to allay any fears, that obviously was not a real $100 bill. Because I have elders in the room and that would not be a good career move, Right? See, we're not greedy people. We just want to make sure that what we're investing and what we're giving towards is actually going to to something that truly and honestly matters. It's going to make a real difference. So something has to change in us about our thinking. So I want you to turn in your Bibles again to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And, And this is the passage I read last week. But I want to focus on some specific verses here. And I want you to pay attention to the metaphor that Paul uses when he's talking about us giving. At the, in the early part of this passage, and again, he's talking to a church that's, that's a mess. In most cases, most of the first and second Corinthians is written to try and correct issues going on in the church. But second Corinthians nine is the exception to that rule. This is Paul actually telling them what a fantastic job they're doing in this particular area of giving. And he says, I know you've got a gift that you've been collecting for a year, but I want to make sure that you're giving that thing willingly, not grudgingly. And in verse six, Again, pay attention to the metaphor that Paul uses. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives what? Cheerfully. And God will generously provide all that you need, just like we heard in Chip's story. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I'm fairly confident when Paul wrote this, he was not thinking that 2,000 years down the road, Chip would get a phone that he, he needed. I can guarantee that's not what was on Paul's mind. But God gives in ways we can't even begin to imagine. And then jump down to verse 10. For, the God, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Did you notice the metaphor that Paul uses when he's talking about giving here? What kind of language does he use? A farmer. Let me ask you, how many farmers in the room? Uh Uh-huh. In last service, there were four. So in this whole church body, we have four farmers. And I would actually say, based on who actually raised their hands, they were four previous farmers. I don't think they're doing a lot of farming even today. They just have that in their background. Well, so what are some of the words he uses around this whole idea of farming? Sowing and planting and seeds and harvesting, right? And some very clear, simple principles in this whole thing. But they're interesting and they're powerful. Number one, who, according to Paul, provides the seed for the farmer to plant? 
God does. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer. And then he also provides the harvest, the bread that we get. What is our job in this whole farming thing? Is it to procure the seed? No. Whose job is that? That's God's. Is it to make the plant grow and make a bountiful harvest? No, that is also God's. What is our role in this whole farming thing? To plant. To take the seed that God has given to us in the first place, all of these resources that you and I have have been given by God to us, and he says, if you will take that and plant it, and you will get a huge harvest. Now, I'm not a huge, because I'm not a farmer, and I have two brown thumbs. I'm not a big, uh, this whole metaphor is kind of hard for me. If I need a plant, guess what I do? Yeah, I go buy it. And Home Depot has row upon row upon row of plants. Now, when I kill that plant, I go back to Home Depot and get another one, right? If I need an ear of corn, where do I go? To the grocery store where all, plant, where all food comes from. That's its origination point, right? No, we know it came from somewhere else. In fact, what Paul says is the farmer who plants just two seeds, what kind of harvest can he expect? Small, a meager harvest. But if I'm able to plant thousands of seeds, what kind of harvest can I expect? A lot. What's the obvious impl implication for you and I? It's a simple lesson for you and I. Plant a lot. Out of the resources that God has given you and I, we should be planting as much as we can because when we plant a lot, there's a huge harvest that comes out of that. When we only plant a little, there's a little harvest. So if we're not getting a harvest, what's the problem? We're not planning enough. Very simple. But there's a problem in this whole metaphor, and it's the fact that none of us are farmers. So I want to change the metaphor a little bit. And that's still a biblical metaphor. It's a metaphor that Jesus himself uses. But instead of talking about planting and sowing, let's talk about investing. Now, that's a language we can all get behind, right? We live in a financial culture. So what does investing mean? In our day and age, what does investing mean? I take money and I give it to somebody else and they do something with it. And what do I get in return? Hopefully more money. It's like magic. I give you money and hopefully you give me more money. Now, does it always work out that way? No, because there's a risk involved in investing. And we're going to talk about that risk here in a little bit. But I, I want to, how many of you are in a really good mood this morning? Okay, I'm going to depress you a little bit. Just a little bit, all right? But hang with me. We're going to come around. Because I want to talk about investing and the power of investing, or at least the potential power. I'm going to, I want you to pretend for a little bit that you had $100, okay? Like that $100 that went up in smoke. And I, and I gave you that $100, and I asked you to invest it in some companies when they initially went, when they went public, when they did their IPO. $100 at these companies' IPO. Listen to the returns that you would have gotten, okay? Starbucks. In 1992, if you'd invested $100 in Starbucks, you would today have $26,000 out of that $100. All right, how about Apple? In 2002, if you'd invested that $100, you'd have $43,000 today. Now, some of this is because of how long you would have invested it. Some of it, most of it is about their success, what you would have been investing in. All right, number four, Amazon in 1997, $120,000. Number three, Microsoft in 1986. Now, some of you aren't even alive, but if you were and you had done $100 in Microsoft in 1986, you'd have $148,000 today. Walmart, 1969. If you'd invested that $100 in 1969, you'd have one and a quarter million dollars today. Our last company is Nike. Nike in the 80s. If you'd invested $100 in Nike in the 80s, how much would you have today? Any guesses? 2.5. What was that? 2.5. Do I hear three? <laughs> how about $6.4 million? Out of how much of an investment? $100. $100. If you'd gotten in, a, now the problem is, now could you, were there people that invested $100 back in 1980? Yeah. 
but they didn't invest it in Nike. I don't know what they were investing in. They probably in Tickle Me Elmo or something like that. <laughs> Did they, do they have $6.4 million to speak of today? No, they don't. And this meant you had to get on the very ground floor. So you had to know exactly when and exactly where to invest your money. But if you invest the right way, if you do it right, what can happen? Returns. Huge returns can come your way, right? So, the, but we're not talking about investing in companies. This will just depress you if you keep going down this road. And by the way, this is all hindsight, right? It's easy to look back and go, well, yeah, if you'd invested in such and such or such and such, but there are plenty of companies that, people that invested in something, they lost everything. They would have lost that $100. It literally did go up in smoke, like the $100 I lit on fire earlier. But we're not talking about investing in companies. When we're talking about giving, what are we talking about investing in? Right, God's kingdom. We're, really, we're talking about investing in God and his stuff. But there's some important questions whether we're talking investing in the world or we're talking about investing spiritually that we need to answer. Here's question number one. What are the things you're investing? Now, in the world, it's very simple. What are we typically investing when we're talking about investments in the world? Money. When we're talking spiritually, it goes beyond that. What, what, what are the things we invest in spiritually? Time. All right, how many of you could use a little more time in your life? We talked about this last week, right? But here's the thing. And, and when we talk about the world and we look at some of those companies on the board, like Jeff Bezos or uh, uh, who's the Starbucks guy? Who is Starbucks now? Schultz, uh, who else? Uh, the Walmart family, Microsoft, Bill Gates. Let me ask you this. Do you think Bill Gates has more money than you? Yes. Is it fair to say that Bill Gates has more money than all of us combined? If we pulled every resource we had, we would still not even come close to how much money Bill Gates has. He has more financial resources than you and I can, can even begin to fathom. But does he have any more time than you have? No. no. He has the same 24 hours in his day as you have. He has the exact same amount of time. The question is, how are you and I investing our time in God's kingdom? Where are you investing it? What are you investing it in? How are you spending your time for God is the big question when it comes to investing because you have to invest in the right thing. And you are investing in something. You are spending your time somewhere. You know how I know? Because look at your watch, if you got a watch. If you got a phone, it's harder, but you could probably do it. If you look at it long enough, what do you notice? It just keeps moving. It keeps plugging away. So you are spending your time. You're investing your time somewhere. Now, it might be in front of a television. It might be at your work, place of work. The question is, how can you invest your time in God's kingdom? All right, that's one resource. What's another resource that we have to, to invest in God's kingdom? Time. Talents, right? We're going to hit the three T's. Those of you who've been in church a long time. Time, treasure, ta time, talents, and treasures. What are your talents? Right, your skills. Scripture says God has given each one of us a gift from his great bounty of gifts and he wants us to use them to encourage and love one another. How are you using your skills and abilities? Now, first of all, do you have a skill? Yes. Yeah. You've got a passion, something you love, something you're good at doing. Some of us, it's more computer related. Some of us, it's more relationally related. Some of you, it's financially based. Uh, whatever your gift is, the question is, are you using it in God's kingdom? What's the third? Time, talent, treasure. When we're talking about treasure, we're talking about finances. How are you using the resource, the financial resources that God has given you to build his kingdom? Are you investing them in his kingdom? Now, this leads to the second question. Not only what are you investing, are you investing your time and your talents and your treasures, but what are you investing in? And when it comes to this topic, there's two areas, two places we can invest. We can invest in the world and we can invest in God's kingdom. And where you invest and how you invest depends on the returns that you can expect to get. Now, how do we invest in the world? Let's talk about the three things, times and talents. Where do you invest your time and your talent in the world? Work. work. Right? How many of you have spent any time at work this week? Whether you enjoyed it or not. 
You spent time at work and you gave, you had a talent, a skill that you deployed in that workplace. Now, that, you, you invested there. What was the return on your time and your talent? Salary. Salary. You got money. It was, it's really not an investment. It's more of a exchange. Now, the question is, are you getting a good exchange for what you're giving? Your time and your talents, are you getting a good exchange? If you work at McDonald's, the answer is no. If you work at Walmart, the answer may be, well, kind of. If you work at E.F. Hutton or one of those other, I don't know, if I, that's a whole thing. Well, uh, uh, Charles Schwab. Then maybe the answer is, yeah, maybe I make a really good living. But it's an investment. It's a swap that you're making. And if that's not really investment, how do we invest in the world? What are ways that we invest in the world? Missions? What's that? <coughs> Oh, time on social media. Anyone ever spent any of their time on social media? Getting good returns there? <laughs> Family. Okay, well, I heard something else. Gambling. Gambling. I'm not going to ask if anyone did or not. Is it, would most of us think of that as an investment? No, but are you spending your time there? Yep. I guess this could be a talent, right? Pull that lever, right? This is difficult. Now, the easy one is, how do you invest in the world financially? Shopping. <laughs> I don't know who said that. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that because I'd like to stay married. <laughs> What's the most obvious way we invest in the world financially? Stocks. Yeah, stocks and bonds, right? The stuff we were just talking about. And you hope that you get a return. Here's what I tell you. Whether you're investing in the world in your work or in the financial markets or in social media, wherever you're spending your time and your energy and your finances, wherever you're spending, when you invest in the world, what kind of returns are you getting back from the world? Money. Okay, there is some money. You can get financial stability. Do we all? No, but you can. What are the other returns that we get? Stress. Stress. What else? What's that? Wasted time. Wasted time. Anger. Anger. Greed. In fact, we were talking in the last service a little bit. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who have financial stability in the world. Like a lot of financial stability. You go to Hollywood, you can find people that have a lot of money there. Are they always the happiest people? They're no, they're often very depressed. You see suicides among those, some of the richest people in the world. And you go, how is that possible? You're doing it wrong. Right? But the problem is the returns that they're getting are not the kind of returns that we really want. There's greed. There's broken relationships. It's all temporary and unsatisfying. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you want out of life? Something that's completely unsatisfying and isn't going to last anyway? Even if you go and buy the best toy in the world, right? My boys keep asking me, what, what kind of car would I, if I could have any car in the world and it was paid for and all the maintenance, what car would I like? You know what? It, it, I can answer that any way I want to. You know what's going to happen in 20 years? Right, it's going to be broken down and I'm going to need a new one. It all, it's all temporary. It doesn't last. How many funerals have you been to where that, that person got to keep all the toys? They don't. You don't get to take it with you. All of it is very temporary. But when we invest in God's kingdom, we're investing in the eternal. And what are the returns from God's kingdom? How about this list? How about love, joy, hope, peace, healthy, healthy, lasting relationships, eternal security, changing the world and having an eternal impact? I think Leslie said mission work is investing in the world. Actually, mission work is investing in God's kingdom, which affects the world, doesn't it? Where should we be investing our money? Where should we be investing our skills and our time? We should be investing in God's kingdom because that's where we get the greatest return. If I said, look, if I went back to 1980 and said, you can invest in Nike or you can invest in even McDonald's, which one should you have invested in? Nike. Nike. Why? The return was greater. Where is the bigger return? God's kingdom or the world's? God's kingdom. So when we begin to, to change how we think about even giving, is it going up in smoke? So, well, Pastor, here's the problem. See, it's not about me giving to God's kingdom. What you're asking me to do is give to the church or give to a mission thing. And when I give that money, it, I don't know where it goes. I don't know what's happening. Can I let you in on a secret? The church is God's chosen mechanism for changing the world. 
Mission work is his chosen mechanism for changing the world. It's the commission that he's given us. Now, are there churches that waste finances? Yes. Yes. Are, does any church do it perfectly? No. But it's still God's chosen instrument to change the world. So you need to be investing your time in the church and in mission work. You need to be investing your skills in the church and in mission work. You need to be investing your finances in the church and in mission work because that's where eternal rewards come from. Let me ask you this. And then I've got four minutes and I've got one important question for you. Here's my question. How many of you have ever had somebody or know somebody in your life who does not know Jesus or you have a broken relationship that you would like to have healed or you, would, you see something in the world that is broken that you think needs to be made better? Raise your hand. If you can answer yes to any one of those. And if you can answer yes to all of them, raise both hands, right? Would we agree that the world is a mess? Can the world fix it? Has it tried? Every time the world tries to fix itself, what happens? It gets worse and worse. The only thing that can change the world is Jesus Christ. And he's chosen to use the church and mission work to change that world. So where should we invest our resources? You want to make a change? Let me ask you this. If you could go back in time and give $100 and know that someone in your life would know Jesus and spend all the rest of eternity with him, would you give that $100? Would you give an hour of your time to know that a family member of yours, their relationship, their marriage would be healed and happy and healthy? Would you give an hour to see that happen? Yes. Would you give your skills and talents? Would you cook some food or clean a house if it meant that the world would be different? The problem is we don't see a correlation between one and the other, but I want to tell you, when you give to God's kingdom, things happen that you cannot even begin to imagine. God doesn't say, plant here and and I'll tell you the plan of how this is going to sprout. In fact, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, God saw the harvest. We don't always get to see how it works out. But here's what I know. If you're not investing, you get zero reward. It's that simple, right? I don't get to go to Nike and go, you know what? I meant to give you $100 in 1980. Can I have my $6.4 million now? What would Nike say? Doesn't work that way. But wait a minute. If in 1980 I gave you $100, today you'd give me $6.4 million. And they'd say, yeah, but there's a part of that equation missing. You didn't give the $100, so you get none of the investment return. We've got to be investing in God's kingdom. And and part of the problem in a lot of churches and the problem with the world is we want the return without the investment. Right? So where are you investing? Where are you investing your resources? And when I put this on here, I had a hard time because that's part of the problem, isn't it? We think this is mine. But who provided this to begin with? God did. So the real question isn't where am I investing my resources? The real question is where am I investing God's resources? God said, I'm giving you this. And yes, you get to use some of it to take care of yourself and pay bills and watch Netflix and have a car because I want you to live and be happy. But I also want you to use it to make a difference in the world. Where are you investing the resources God has given you? Start investing in the eternal kingdom of God. And I promise you when you do that, nothing will ever be the same. Forget I getting a free phone. That's a really good story, isn't it? And that shows how much God loves us. Can you imagine? And we think, well, and this is not, please listen to me, I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. This is not if you give $100, God will give you $6.4 million in 20 years. That's not how it works. But imagine someone in, let's say you had $3 billion and you got to give that $3 billion so that someone you know could be happy and healthy, would you give it? Because that's more important relationships are more important eternity is more important the things that god wants to do with your resources are beyond your imagination but you got to start planting amen all right let's stand and pray father i'm excited about this because i'm excited about the things that you can do and i look around this room and i see people with talent 
I see people that are, that are already investing. Their time. I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking, well, man, I'm not investing enough or I'm not giving enough or I'm not giving my resources. That's not for me to know or to answer. I just know, Father, that your word says whatever we're giving, if we'll give more, there'll be a bigger harvest. If I'm giving a little bit of my time, if I give more of my time, there'll be a greater return. If I give more of my skills and passions and gifts, there, there'll be a greater return on that investment. Father, ultimately, we don't want to see just a big church. We don't want to have a great, nice building. Uh, we, we don't want to have you know, every single problem in our, well, we might want every single problem in our lives res- taken care of. What we really want is to see this community, this body of believers, the people that, that call this place their home, the people that live in this community, the people we work with, the people we play with, the people that we live our lives with, we want them to know you and become everything that you have designed them to be. And that only happens when we're investing in the things that really matter. So Father, if we're investing resources the wrong way, I pray that you'll help us to begin to invest them in your kingdom and begin to see kingdom kind of results trusting you with the result. We thank you for the resources that you've given us. Help us to invest them the way that you want us to in the, in the places you want us to see the greatest return for your kingdom. And we will thank you for the harvest that you pour out on us. Father, thank you for every person here, the gifting that you've given them, the resources you've poured into their lives. Help each one of us to find where you want us to invest those resources in your kingdom. And we thank you for the result that we're going to see. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Go invest in God's kingdom and stack a chair. Have a great afternoon.